Sure. Go for it. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome a holistic nutritionist, a best-selling author, a wellness expert, and celebrity health coach. Her name is Kelly Levick, if I said your last name correctly. <laughs> yeah, Levesque, you got it. Levesque, Levesque, Levesque. I uh, apologize in advance for that. I've made two mistakes already today. Let's go for a third. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, you're based in Los Angeles, California, I believe. Be Well grew out of Kelly's lifelong passion for health, the science of nutrition and overall wellness guided by a practical and always optimistic approach. Kelly helps clients improve their health, achieve their goals, and develop sustainable habits to live a healthy and balanced life. You have a very, very long bio that I won't get into. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say welcome so much to the Storybox podcast, Kelly Levesque. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It's so good to have you here. I mean, we had a bit of a, a technical difficulty, which hardly ever happens here on the Storybox, but it's uh, it, you, your grace and your patience was absolutely uh appreciate it <laughs> it's 2 15 over here for me not 7 a.m so i've been able to handle my inbox and have a little lunch and my kids are sleeping so you have a minute all things work together for good <laughs> right so I'm, I'm glad that's all happened and we're actually here speaking my first question that i love starting off all my conversations with is what does success look like for you Success for me is, I mean, this is very controversial, but for me, it's doing what I love. Um, a lot of my job is doing things I don't love, but the majority of my job is doing what I'm really passionate about and love so greatly. And that is reading and understand, uh, understanding the newest research when it comes to nutrition and being able to explain that to my clients in a sustainable way so they can take action in their own life. So you mentioned there that's a controversial opinion. Why do you think that some people believe that it is a controversial thing to do what you love doing? Well, because you can't always do what you love. Um, and people who think it's controversial will say, you know, I love walking dogs, but that's not going to afford me the life that I want. Or I love fishing, but I live in Texas. Or, you know, I don't know if you know our geography, but you know, depending on where that is, that may be in the middle of the country. If you're like, mm. you know, in the middle of that state, I think what they're saying is a lot of people find or feel unhappy in their job because they're not quote unquote doing what they love. And I think that there's a really beautiful life that can be created working in a space where you feel valued, where you're using your skill sets, where you're using, um, where you're able to do the things that you're good at and still do the things that you love in your free time. Mm -hmm. And, um, I th I think personally, and with the clients that I've worked with for a decade, you know, people's jobs play a role in how they take care of themselves, whether they are working 14 hour days or their, you know, maybe their paycheck is um, month to month and they're freelance. And so they don't have financial security or their job doesn't allow for them to maybe join the gym. They want to gym or travel and that's what they love doing. And that's what they want to do. So, you know, I, I know and realize how blessed I am that I have, created this company in, and this role for myself and that it took off and was successful. I know that a lot of that was really hard work. A lot of that was sticking it out for the long haul and a little bit of luck. And it was a little, it's the perfect storm. And I can't say that, you know, I'm not sure that it would happen again exactly the same way, but you know, I would try just as hard and I would go just as long. Mm. So why did you decide to do your current business in the first place? And what were, what kept you motivated or what kept you going during the hard times? Yeah. Um, I will say, so if people don't know my background, I spent eight years in cancer and genetics. So I had a, I guess you can call it a big girl job. I had a big job in, um, I covered the eight West coast states of California. I had a team under me. I had, people that I was managing. I worked with some of the, um, like, I guess the most well-known MDs here in California and in the West coast States hospitals like Cedar Sinai, UCLA was 
in the conversation um, and educating doctors in specific new technologies for cancer and genetics, where we mapped tumor genes. And um, it was just really cool new technology. And when I went to start Be Well by Kelly, it was a side hustle for three years. It wasn't something that I just quit that job for and said, oh, well, I really want to do this. So I'm just going to quit and start. And it was the best decision I ever made because looking back, I didn't have the pressure of how am I going to pay my bills? I actually got to take the paycheck that I was making um, in my cancer genetics job and pay for a professional photographer to take images of my, of my recipes. And I could take that money to have a website built. And I worked nights and I worked weekends and I worked lunch breaks for three years. Um, but when I decided to take Be Well by Kelly full time, I had a full roster of clients. I felt comfortable jumping off a curb instead of a cliff is what I tell, you know, my mentees, like, why are you throwing yourself off a cliff when you can jump off a curb? You can actually test this. Does this feel right for me? Does it feel good for me? And that's another thing too. I love nutrition. I love science, but I might not have loved the one-on-one -on -one time with clients. I might not have felt energized by that. It was the opposite for me. Luckily, I, I loved it. And so those three years went by so fast. And in that time, I spent those years writing, pre I wrote, wrote nutrition articles for really popular blogs and magazines, all for free, mind you, while other people are freelancing this. This was my way to be my own publicist, to get my name out there, to drive people to my website, to drive people to my Instagram, to get those clients in my office so that I could work with them day to day. And it, it, it's almost like it was a blink of an eye and the three-year mark had hit. And it, it was that point where I was like, gosh, I really just got to take this full time. And even then I went to my boss at the cancer genetics company. And I said, Hey, look, she, we had a great relationship. I really loved working here. I really need to see this other business that I built through. And she went back to the CEO of the company and said, you know, Kelly's built this amazing side business. She wants to go do it. I'd love to keep her on the big accounts. Can we keep her on Cedar sinai Can we keep her on UCLA? Can we do a consulting agreement? And even then I had a three month buffer during that, that last summer it was like June to September ish, maybe a little longer where I just got to work with the biggest accounts that I held on to for that company and worked freelance for them. They created that role for me because I was providing value. And I think we, you always have to just ask. You have to ask for the bridge. Everyone needs a bridge when they're building a business. And, um, and it really worked out. Uh, I think I probably could have left at the one and a half year mark, mm. but it would have been harder. And I would have felt the pressure to sign clients up for multiple sessions and I would have felt the pressure to a little bit be like a used car salesman. Like I have to get this deal or I'm not going to be able to feed my family because at the point where I left my business, I was actually the breadwinner and only income in my, in my marriage and have been that way. And now we have two sons and my husband's a stay at home dad. And I, I run the ship and, and it's been because of this side hustle. I would never have built this business the way it is without the finances to support doing it. And yeah, that's when, you know, you really want something, you do it on the weekends, you do it at nights, you say no to things, um, you do things for free. Uh, and, and you just put that good karma juju out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. And I love how you mentioned, you know, just ask my, my audience knows that my grandfather used to say, if you don't ask, you don't get, so don't be afraid to ask. And I've also had conversations with people on, on the show about how they've still got a job and it's wiser to keep your job and do your passion on the side until your passion can actually afford or give you more money than what your actual job can, can provide. So I'm, I'm curious for someone that kind of feels stuck in their current position right now, they don't have a side hustle. They don't know exactly where they want to go in their life or their career. They're just miserable. What advice would you give to them? Well, I definitely think you should think about what you're good at. Um, so for me, I love distilling down information, using analogies, explaining things to people, making them feel empowered. 
that's what I was good at in my cancer and genetics role. I was taking this information, working with physicians, get, making them feel empowered with this new information, not um, like intimidated by it so that they could change the lives of their patients. And that's what that's what really translates into my role now. Like anyone can go be a nutritionist, but I think it's the way that I translate the information and make it accessible to people. They don't have to have, you know, a PhD in, or some more an MD to understand what I'm saying. They can immediately apply it to their life. So think about whether you're an accountant or a lawyer, or maybe you're a podcaster or whatever it is that you're doing and you hate Think about what parts in that job you're good at and, and how they could translate into something that you are passionate about. You know, I think it's interesting too. We expect to know what that role will be. We expect to know that we're going to love something. And I, I really caution people against that. It's much better to fail faster than it is to never try. And so a good example of that for me is I felt like as a holistic nutritionist and health coach, I felt like I needed to be everything. I have a certification to be a personal trainer. I have a prenatal certification on top of that. I have a certification to be, I have 200 hours in yoga teacher training. I have sculpt training on top of that. And I trained people in real life and was their nutritionist. And then I taught yoga and was their nutritionist and taught yoga at a studio in the beginning of this. So I've been doing this for a decade. My first few years was deciding things weren't working out or deciding things didn't feel right. And you are not going to know if they're going to feel right unless you get your hands dirty and get out there and do it. I think we build up what it's going to be like in our head and we get too anxious about how we're actually going to execute it instead of saying, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to go sign up for, you know, uh, auditions for this teacher training thing or auditions for this class. Okay. They're, they're going to let me teach two or three yoga classes. I'm going to try it on for size. I'm going to see how it feels for me. I loved yoga. I'm so passionate about yoga, but what ended up happening was I was teaching four to six classes a week and I wasn't practicing. So where did my passion go? My passion wasn't in teaching the yoga. My passion wasn't doing the yoga, but that's where the confusion lies is what are you passionate about versus, versus like what, I mean, that's kind of like, I was, I was in the eco, I was in the ecosystem or the universe of yoga, but I wasn't actually doing the yoga. So I'm not doing my passion. I think it's so easy for people to get stuck in making this grand plan. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with a couple of my friends that keep, they ask me, Jay, what do I need to do in order to get this up and running? And I said, just start it. And I said, like, that's the first step is actually starting. I think people, like I was saying before, they get bogged down in trying to make it work. And then if it doesn't work in their mind, then it won't work out in the real world. So that's what keeps people from doing their passion. And and I think it, it is wise to sort of have somewhat of an idea of what you want to do. I mean, for example, this, I had an inkling, I had a, a vision in my mind, but I didn't know the actual steps leading up to getting it to what it is today. That was the the joy of the process and failing well <laughs> many yeah. times over. So it's yeah, it's, interesting. it's so true because if you think about it too, you're not, the confidence comes from the actual work. The confidence doesn't come from thinking about the work. It doesn't come from building the website and making the pamphlets and doing your canned emails. Like the confidence doesn't come from any of that. The confidence comes from having the conversations, sitting down with the clients, doing the actual work. And you're not going to be an expert at it at the very beginning. So there's this rub where people never actually step off the curb. They never actually see the clients. They don't tape the podcast. They don't have, they don't do the work Mm. because they're so caught up that they need to be Google. You are not Google. You are not the expert you do not know all it is your expertise and your ability to have a successful business is how you answer people's needs, how you show up for them, how you search for them high and wide. They need to feel better. They want to start their business. They want to feel empowered. If, if you don't have the answers, all you have to say is, you know what, this is a really big problem that I want to help you with. Give me a day. Let me do some research. I'm going to find the perfect plan for you and I'm going to help you get there. Mm. 
Mm. That's it. It can be that simple, but as human beings, we complicate it. <laughs> it's it's very true. So I'm curious for cancer and genetics, which is a very interesting line of, of study uh, for anyone, do you notice that what you're doing today kind of carries over at all with nutrition and sort of healing people through that have cancer or has that ever happened for you? I've definitely worked with clients who are um, undergoing cancer treatment, radiation, chemotherapy, excision, surgeries. Um, I have clients who have a genetic predisposition to getting cancer. I have clients whose family members have cancer and then the whole family wants to get healthy. Um, What was really hard for me in the cancer space was that I learned how to read studies. I learned how to mine the research. I spent a lot of time in PubMed or on Google Google Scholar. I had Google alerts to specific disease states like metabolic syndrome and um, type two diabetes and things I was really passionate about. And um, and I would read these studies, and there, you know, it's really it's really hard to be on the back end of illness. I'd rather be on the prevention and that was something that was gnawing at me inside. Like I just wanted to work with people to support them to never have to deal with something like this. And obviously there are so many things outside of our control um, from endocrine disrupting chemicals to genetics to all kinds of things that would potentially increase our risk of getting cancer. Mm. But I want, I'm a really glass half full positive kind of person. Like I want to be on the front end of things. I want to be helping people with sustainable habits. It's not like a diet this week and a new trend the next week. It's, is this sustainable? Is this something that you will be doing? Is this a way you will be eating when you're 90 years old? Would you feed your kids this way, your husband this way, your grandma this way? is this sustainable for you? And if there's something interesting in the press or the media, whether that's intermittent fasting or bulletproof coffee or matcha or adding curcumin, turmeric, like hot and cold, you know, you pick, you pick a tool or modality. Those are all just, that's icing on the cake. You got to get good at the good stuff. It's the food, the sleep, the movement, the stress. Those are, those are the foundations. And we were too busy. People are too busy to get those foundational elements right. And they're reaching for, well, I'll just drink this matcha now instead of my coffee. And that's going to be the cure to all my issues. And it's, you know, I love, I love food and wellness around. I love food and like the ability to build a healthy relationship with it as the greatest foundation of wellness in your life. Mm. Like it just, it's hard for people because it it can be addicting. There are highly palatable foods. There are things that cause people to overeat um, and it's not their fault. You know, I mean, it's everyone. And so it's the one addiction, which is really interesting that you can't just abstain from. You have to have a good relationship with food and you're constantly working on it. It's this relationship you have to continue to focus on. And, um, and so I like to get my clients to this place where, you know, maybe they've, been having a rough go at their relationship with food and wellness for in their early years. I think when you leave your parents home and your parents eat a certain way, and then you go to, you guys, I think you guys call it uni or college or whatever it is. And maybe things are um, a little extreme for people. And then they get into their twenties and they get excited about wellness and hacking and starting their business and being successful or whatever their goals are. And, and food sort of they start to develop this relationship with food. My favorite place is when we fast track through the quick fix diet. Mm. This will fix all my problems period. And we get to this place of, yeah, I just make myself, you know, protein, vegetables. I I make a lot of my meals at home. I have some really great restaurants that I like to go to. I break bread with my friends and family. I'm going to bed a little bit earlier. I, I, I really love this yoga class or this lifting, um, gym and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have bigger goals and it just becomes this like buzz in the background that it's definitely what's supporting them to get to where they want to go. But my goal always is to fast track those, those, those years out of school where you're just trying to figure out what is your relationship with food and get people to a place where food isn't keeping them from their goals. Mm. 
you mentioned bulletproof coffee and bio or I think it was biohacking, which uh, yeah. or hacking in general. And I, <laughs> I, I can't, I can be reminded of my friend Dave Asprey, who is the founder of Bulletproof Coffee and the father of biohacking, you could say, with with food. Great man, love his story uh, and love his wisdom and advice. And having said all this, and I'm curious, do you believe in in real balance in life? I have an analogy about balance um, because I think what people think is balance, most of the time they're missing the mark. When I sit down with the clients, they're like, I just want to have balance in my life. Like I love a day where I wake up and I go outside with my coffee and I look at the sun and the sun's the first thing that comes through my eyes in the morning. And then I do a fat, you know, a caffeine only fasted style workout where it's like a little bit of cardio and then some strength. And then I meditate at the end of that and I start my work day. And then I work, I fast a little, then I have like a balanced lunch. And, and then it gives me this perfect day. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Um, and what that is, is that's so much control and perfection that it's hard to repeat. It's almost robotic. It's not emotional. It's not fluid. It's not flowing in your body. And and what I give them an example of is a pendulum ball. Mm. I say, the problem is, is you're trying to stop your pendulum ball. Like you're trying to say, this is where it's going to sit. It's going to sit in the midline a hundred percent of the time. And it's going to be perfect. The problem is, is when things go wrong, that pendulum ball swings drastically right and left. And they go from cleanse to binge, to cleanse, to binge with this ultimate goal of having a perfect day and stopping their ball. And I always tell them you're, you, balance is the bounce off the midline. Mm -hmm. Balance is a tight, is tight, is this tight homeostasis. It's what we want in our blood sugar. It's what we want in our pH. It's, it's, it's not perfection. It's knowing that every day is going to be different, but that if say, for example, you, you know, had the cookie instead of deciding to do a juice cleanse the next day, can you bounce just a little bit off that midline? That cookie then turns into a hey, that was no big deal. That's not going to affect me emotionally in a way that I'm going to over overreact to this. But instead, I'm going to jump on my phone right now and sign up for that yoga class tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And then that yoga class makes you feel good and you get that momentum. You leave the gym and you're like, hey, I'll have a green smoothie or I'll have like an egg scramble. And then you allow that momentum to continue to bounce you off that midline. And if something bounces you a little further than you wanted, we don't overreact. We try to bring our focus to it never stops. It's never perfect. And we don't need to start over because we're constantly moving. It's just getting that tight, that tight bounce. Mm, I love that uh, analogy. I, I struggled for a lot of my life with this concept of perfection and what that meant for my life. And I always believed and was conditioned and somehow the addiction sort of ran rampant in my life and I ended up with an eating disorder. I ended up with uh, binge eating, uh, all kinds of horrendous stuff, uh, which landed me in hospital for nine days. Crazy story. Um, and I realized literally on the last day and a nurse had spoken to me the night before. She's like, Jay, what are you doing in here? You are... 22 years old you should not be in hospital you should be out enjoying your life you should be free to enjoy your life why are you so clamped down on everything you're so strict you're not that's probably why one of the reasons why you landed in here and i didn't tell her the full reason why i was in there i sort of made up excuses as you do um and the last day that i was there i realized that hey I had been trying so hard to get this idea of balance in my life, but it wasn't really balanced. I had convinced myself that it was, but it really wasn't. It was this perfectionistic mindset that was un unattainable and it landed me there. And I didn't listen to people that knew better. My diet suffered. Everything just came crumbling down. So what I needed to do was release myself. I needed to forgive myself first and foremost and start the, the long and extensive healing process because when you do have an eating disorder, it never goes away from you. You just learn how to manage it every single day. So now that I've got it, every morning that I wake up, 
I'm always mindful. And people have asked me, Kelly, it's, it's like, how's, how's your health going now, Jay? And it's a constant, it's a different thing every single day. And I'm like, my diet now, I love to call the freedom diet. <laughs> like it's this, I have this holistic mindset around what I eat. But if I have like a, a cookie or a, a donut, then I'm not going to beat myself up or go for a three hour run or like spit and chew like I used to do, you know, that, that rhymes. So like, <laughs> yeah, uh, if that helps at all with, with defining everything you're just saying, um, well, from a personal level. I definitely want to just thank you for sharing that story and being vulnerable to share that with your audience, because one in eight people deal with an eating disorder. It's a very, um, private, shameful thing that isn't shared because of the way it's looked at, but it, there are so many people struggling with it because it is a place where we control food is a place where we can control something about our day when we feel like we can control other things. And unfortunately, when we look at parenting and I'm not going to blame our parents, but when we look at, we look at the generations above us, there was no vulnerability. There was no talking about emotions. There was there, there was no acceptance when things were not as they were supposed to be. You look at like my grandparents, this is the way it's supposed to be for my dad. And my, my parents, uh, that generation softens and our generation softens. And now as a parent, all I want to do for my sons is allow them to be emotional, to be vulnerable for things, for it to be absolutely okay. Whatever their experience is with, with what they're going through and to just be that person to support them through it. Because a lot of times that control is coming out of things outside of food. And there's just this, this really easy, quick way to control your life. And that's with food. And especially an overachiever like yourself, you think about all the things you want to do in your life. And, um, and we have what in our head is like, this is right. And this is wrong. These, these tan six pack bikini bodies are right. This mm -hmm. other look is wrong. And we really need to break down stereotypes. We really need, we, we really need, you know, relationships and how we feel and life experiences to be the, the wealth and health of life. Um, and so I just, I'm sorry that you went through that. I know that there's absolutely silver linings on the outside of that. Look at this podcast, look at the people whose lives you're touching every day. Um, but thank you for sharing that with me. That's, you know, I, th I think we beat the same drum. It's really important for people to have freedom with their food and to, to just reframe the way they look at all of these fads coming out and the way that they look at, um, look at, just look at things as tools, mm. like all Dave Asbury stuff. Those are tools. Fab four smoothie. That's a tool. Infrared saunas, red light therapy, cryo. Th these are tools. Yeah. Is it sustainable for you for the long term? Maybe yes, maybe no. You buy an a sauna. If not, it's probably not sustainable for you to pay to go to a sauna, you know, every day or whatever. But um yeah, I don't know. I just uh thank you for sharing that story and and for sharing that with your audience too. I'm I'm sure they've heard it, but that's really powerful. You're more than welcome. And I get even more vulnerable and share the actual root cause of me ending up with an eating disorder and it stemmed from, and I'm glad that you mentioned the bikini body and all that stuff, because from the age of 12, I was exposed to porn and going through that whole experience of looking at what a, a guy is supposed to be, what a woman's looking for in a man, the whole, you know, the crazy poison that porn is. And that's my perspective on it. And in the way it, it, and what it did to my brain, so to speak, and the healing that I had to go through to get that out. But I thought that I, if I, if I didn't have this, if I didn't restrict, if I didn't have the six pack abs, if I didn't have any of that, then I wouldn't feel like I was worth anything. I wouldn't be loved by anyone. So as a result, I started working out even harder. And then I started restricting my food. I started yeah, doing things that I thought was quote healthy, but it wasn't healthy. And then I was just feeding off uh, when one addiction, uh, it's interesting how if you have one addiction and then you try and suppress that one, then another one starts to form. So 
I had two addictions that I was managing at the same time. All the while I had this persona that there was no addiction at all. So it was this crazy long process that when it all came crashing down, it came crashing down. (laughs) So uh, I just want to say like we live in such a sexualized world that you look at a movie poster, you look at anything that is going on and it it's drawing a lot of young people's minds to that that way you've got to look so it's not a holistic approach at all it's a one-sided viewpoint of how you are meant to be as a person and how you're meant to look and i believe that that's a problem i don't think it, it is healthy at all i think it it hurts more people than it actually does them good um that's what i've experienced and learned in my my young life. (laughs) (laughs) Very wise for your young life. (laughs) Going through big things makes you wise. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I know that, um, I know that porn addiction and food addiction are, um, the two fastest growing addictions in the, in, within our youth. And it's, it's scary to me. It's access to phones at such a young age, so much screen time. So, so many, you know, junior high doors closed kids with screens. Uh, it's not for me. My kids are going to be outside. Yep. You're going to be signed up for every sport they can play. <laughs> Try and bring them away from it. Um, like if you aren't on, I think you guys call it a pitch. If you aren't on a, <laughs> or like a field, if you aren't on a field with a ball in your hand or on your feet, you know, then you're at my kitchen dinner table, eating healthy foods and talking about your day. I love that. So for you, for you, Kelly, and your life, I sort of want to make this a little bit more lighthearted because yeah. I feel like we've gone like straight for the deep end there. Um, but Let's do it. For your life and being a holistic nutritionist, then what do you think makes a good to great nutritionist or holistic nutritionist in your opinion? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's really important that it's science-based first and foremost, and that it isn't dogmatic. Um, I personally eat animal protein, but I have clients who are raw vegan clients who are vegetarian. You know, I only make, make recommendations, um, outside of those diets. If we're talking about specific years where a woman is trying to get pregnant, pregnant or breastfeeding on there. And in those circumstances that is still okay with me, they're plant-based, but I'm just on them like a, a mom to make sure that they're taking specific supplements because it isn't just about them anymore. Right. Um, so I think science-based is most important, um, not being dogmatic. I also think it's about how well you listen and show up for your clients. Uh, I think people can feel intimidated that they need to know all the science, like I stated a little bit earlier, but really what enacts change in people's lives is a companion, a coach, a mentor, someone who, a relationship, uh, someone to hold them accountable. Mm. And you don't have to be a 14 year, you know, MD with out of the best colleges, um, or universities, you can have, you, you can be the person who's worked your way up with a cert with it, like a certificate to support people own that show up for your clients, listen and help. Mm. So what is your, your goals moving forward for be well? Yeah. Um, well, what I have realized is that launching video courses and education platform using an education platform is a lot faster and easier for me than writing a book, as you now know. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit faster of a process. And I have a lot of information I want to share. I'm, I'm all about empowering my clients. That's what's worked for me on with one on ones. And that's what's working so well in, right now is that you know, I have a pregnancy course. I have a fab four fundamentals course, which is learning how to balance your blood sugar without needing to know what glucose and insulin and the pancreas do and how they all work. Like you can start balancing your blood sugar to support your mood and energy levels. I have a course coming out for kids, um, fab four under four, because I think it's in our youth where we, you know, we're exposed to so much sugar and processed foods And I mean, to this day, I mean, like I know what 
those powdered donuts in the plastic container taste like because I had them as a child so often. And I, you know, if there's a, I'm sure there are other nutritionists out there. It's like, I would, I, I've never eaten one of those. And I would never have that. But I think being real and being truthful is saying like, yeah, donuts taste really good because oh, yeah. they're so <laughs> addictive. They hijack your brain and they're like <laughs> amazing pizza. Like we can talk about all those highly palatable foods, but what I see nowadays is, you know, parents walk into a restaurant, they get their kids, the kids meal, and they go to that restaurant one, maybe two times a week. And then you say, okay, well, that kid gets breaded chicken fingers and fries or quesadilla and chips. And I ask the, the adults, the adults are having vegetables, they're having salads, they're taking care of themselves. And the question is, if you ate that fried food that contains zero vegetables for every meal of the day, how would you feel? How would you learn? How, would you, you know, like, how would your mood be? Because we just, it's amazing how much the clients I have and the people that I've worked with care about themselves, but these are so important. These first few years, it's, it takes three years to, for the, call it the construction of the, their child's microbiome to be complete, like three years to, to form a microbiome, all of these food choices, um, impact their, the, their openness to trying new foods, their acceptance of bitter umami and sour foods, their love of vegetables, their love of whole cooking. And we're so worried, like, oh, send them to Kumon and send them to send them to feet like, um, phonics. And like, they need this grammar and learning. And it's like, you have a kitchen and a grocery store and a farmer's market and pots and pans, and you literally have a backyard, maybe you have the ability to teach your child to empower them with independence, to make this an educational experience where they're picking the veggies, they're your sous chef, they're tasting everything with you, they're seasoning. Yes, it's way more messy. Yes, it's way more work. But if you change the way you look at it and you say, this is an education for them to touch sensory experience, a taste experience, a a reverence for how their food is grown and, and how it ends up on their plate and, and just quality time together away from screens. Instead of being like, you sit in front of this television show, I'm going to make you dinner. Then I'm going to force you to sit in your chair for two minutes. Like you're missing the moments. Like those are the life moments that we can build with our children and really passionate about that. So um, and obviously like be well grows with my life. Like I have a two and a half year old and a six month old. And so I probably wouldn't be excited about kids nutrition at 24, but I am really excited about it now in my thirties. So these are the, these are the things I do as I feel really passionate about something and I take my business that direction. And, um, and so that's, that's how I'm going to follow it forward. It's hasn't, it served me well thus far. So. It really has. And I'm, I'm passionate alongside with you, actually, because I feel like if we want to change a generation, then we've got to educate the kids. The kids yeah. are the future. So what we tell them will impact how they perceive life later on and, and the decisions that they make for our society later on. So if we're teaching them, Absolutely. hey, go and eat processed food all you like, there's no harm in it, then obviously they're going to believe it. And like you just look at where that's taking a lot of young people, there's links to Alzheimer's disease, there's links to cancer, there's links to all kinds of crazy diseases, bowel disease too, like uh, IBS. There's so many people nowadays, like gluten intolerances. Uh, it's just absolutely nuts. And then we, we hear all this information from the wellness experts like yourself, and then we're just like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. That's all, that's all quack. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it seems like there's this stigma around, you know, being, uh, it's, get, it's gotten a lot better here in Australia, I've noticed, but we're still not quite there yet. We still have a long way to go. And I've noticed that, I don't know if it's like this in, in America, but McDonald's is sort of doing like a healthy version of their meals. Like they got a vegan option, but look at the ingredients. <laughs> yeah. Like it, I think we're, I think we're missing the boat with fake Franken foods. I think we're missing the boat with prepackaged foods and processed foods. I, the hard part is, is everyone's overworked and they're working really hard and they're on the success rat race. And so they don't think that they have time for those foods. And so they use the fast foods, but they're like, this is the healthy fast food because this, 
has a label on it that says gluten-free or vegan or whatever you deem is like your health paleo, it's keto, (laughs) whatever it is. And then we jump on that bandwagon and we say, oh, well, this is healthy. So I'll feed it to my, my kids. And I think we need to, healthy food has no label. Healthy food is the stuff you bring home in your grocery bag that you break out on your counter, that you chop, that you roast. That's the healthy food. And we're looking for one ingredient, you know, and I realize it's not everything that you're going to eat, but if the majority of the foods that you eat are whole foods, um, you, I mean, I can't even imagine where, where, at least where the United States would be when it, when, when we look at like the amount of pre-diabetes diabetes, heart disease, fertility issues, just like at the comorbidities to COVID. Like it's, Mm. it's crazy to me. So, um, it's just hard though, because I grew up in the eighties. I was born in the eighties and grew up in the eighties. And what that means is, you know, I grew up surrounded by Pringles and Skittles and super processed foods. Um, so we need to just rip, we need to literally have reform when it comes to what we can feed our children and, um, what, what they can sell to us, you Mm -hmm. know, this, that's the tough stuff. So it's going to take a long time, but I'm going to sit over here and beat my drum about it. And I'm going to empower some moms to make some change and, um, and hope, hopefully leave this world a little bit better than, than it was before I came into it. Love me some Skittles though. Like <laughs> the, the, the perfect cinema food, I tell you what. <laughs> Sorry, it's just the, the mom all that. Like, <laughs> just, um, it's true. Okay, the devil's right advocate there. there. <laughs> um, it's all good. But it, with the final couple of questions for you, Kelly, with the limited time we have left, uh, what would you say has been the weirdest food combination you've ever tried and one of your favorite recipes that is perceived? in your opinion, as weird for others? Um, okay, weird food. Uh, I went on a cruise to Mexico with my friends at the end of high school. And the food that they had out and available was basically pizza and iceberg salad. And so we made pizza salad sandwiches where we shoved a bunch of iceberg inside the pizza just to like make ourselves feel a little bit better. Um, And now when I get a pizza, if I have leafy greens in my fridge, arugula, you've seen pizzas that come with like some arugula salad on top. I always add greens to our pizza. Yeah, right. Okay. I've never actually tried that. Like I'm sort of the the meat lovers only for pizza and I won't won't go anything else. Like that's my husband. Yeah, meat lovers see? pizza, all of the meats on the pizza. I yeah. just take some, I just take a little arugula, a little olive oil, a little sea salt, dress it, throw it on top and he'll eat it. See the Give Italians, it the Italians say that is actual pizza, but yeah. the Aussies and maybe some Americans, I don't know, like they're, they're like, like no, lovers, go. <laughs> yeah. that's the best. Um, yeah, that's cool. I, I, I need to, Give that a go, I think. See how it see how it plays out. But I love um weird food combinations. You should hear some of mine later, but <laughs> Yeah, nice. <laughs> You'd be like, that's just strange, you strange child. But um my my last question for you, Kelly, this is my all time favorite question. I ask everyone at the end. But it's a hypothetical one. So just imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of one hundred. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Then ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. They've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? The first thing that comes to mind is the moments in which I'm the most present with my boys. Um, and a lot of times that means that we're at a beach because phones are away at the beach and being that I have a, the burden or the blessing or the responsibility to be the financial support for my family, that can be a little overwhelming when you look at two small little boys. So I am the best parent I can be at the beach and the phones are away. My husband's probably catching a surf and I get these very focused 
one-on-one play eye contact conversations with my boys. And if I could be that person and that parent in every single video clip, I will, I would have lived the most full life. Mm -hmm. And it's those moments, whether here with you on a podcast or with a client, that's an example of how I feel like I'm living my best life. And that's when I am not somewhere else when I'm present. And so I would hope that that video really just showed the most present moments of my life. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to be the biggest ones. It's, it's when was I really living that my life in that moment? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like anything is missing in your life currently? I think I'd like to have a little girl. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I just, and, and if I have another boy, great. I, I would love a third child. So whoever that, per, whoever that person is would be wonderful. But um, I feel, I feel really, really, really blessed. Mm. Um, and it's interesting because we just bought our first home. My husband and I did. We've been together since 2007. Thank you. Wow. California is California is tough. <laughs> We've been together since 2007. We've been married since 2012. You know, so we're coming up our 10 year wedding anniversary, two children. And, um, you know, I think from the outside people are like, oh, you have these books and you have this. It's been uh, it's been almost a decade of a of hard work and persistence. And, you know, we 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 bought it and it is it's wonderful, but it hasn't changed my life. And I would say, you know, it's never those materialistic things that really make your life full. It's the, it's the present moments where you're living your life in the moment. Mm. You said my favorite word there, persistence. Persistence is the best word ever, <laughs> but uh, congratulations yeah, on, on everything that you are doing in the world and everything that you have accomplished. It is quite inspiring mm -hmm. for someone like myself that is still young and still going, still on the climb up. So can't wait for the next time we get to talk, Kelly, but where can people find you and connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah, so you can come hang out at Be Well by Kelly on all social media platforms. My website's Kelly Levesque and my book series is the Body Love Book Series. Love it. Kelly Levesque, thank you so much for your time today and for coming on the Storybox podcast. My pleasure.